fell into veterinary medicine after I worked at an animal shelter and I really felt that calling. And so that's kind of my first place that I took a, um, a position as a, a volunteer um, when I was in college. And from there, I went to the University of Missouri um, to veterinary school and was there for four more years in my study. Um, and then I went to the Omaha, Nebraska area, and I practiced in a seven doctor practice there for 12 years. And part of the um, time that I was there, for probably the last six to seven years I was there, um, we were selected to be a formal externship site for um, Kansas State University fourth year veterinary students to come and spend some time. And so I really enjoyed that opportunity to be with veterinary students and to be a part of their education. Um, so that led me to go on to want to do a special so um, over the last about five years, I've been working on becoming a specialist in general practice. So um, last year I became boarded in general practice and um, at that time I'd already started here. So I've been here at Kansas State for about three and a half years now. So my job here um, over the last three years has really been exclusively in training the fourth year students when they come into their hospital. Uh, rotation. So um, my goal is to hope that hopefully that they feel more comfortable going out and practicing um, and being able to see patients and clients if they go directly into practice, whether that be large animal or small animal. I want them to feel more comfortable with their communication and um, diagnostic and handling skills. Um, but over the last probably year, I've become even more interested in um, seeing what patients are emotionally going through, not only when they come into the veterinary practice, but also at home. Um, in general practice, we see a lot of behavioral cases. So um, in the state of Kansas, we do have um, a veterinary, and actually in the Kansas City area that we do sometimes refer to who is um, a non-boarded specialist in behavior. But other than that, we don't have anyone else in our state that does uh, exclusively behavior. And um, even in Nebraska, Oklahoma, to my knowledge in Missouri, there are not a behavior specialist. So in general practice, we see a lot of behavior cases. So um, we have to get pretty good at that. And I'm really pleased because this last year, um, we have started a behavior elective at Kansas State. So now our um, second and third year students can take an elective course um, an entire semester learning about different kinds of behavior problems. And so um, this topic is kind of derived out of that because I was asked to speak about um, to our second and third year veterinary students things that they commonly might see in practice and these are really common things we see in practice. Um, I'll also touch on some of the techniques that are used for fear-free practice. So there are now veterinary practices that are going on to do additional training to become fear-free certified specialists and so what that means is we take extra training or online training so that we understand how to recognize signs of anxiety in the patients that we're seeing in the hospital um, how to teach clients what those signs look like, and how to help them to feel less scared when they come in to see us. So we go to great lengths to make them as comfortable as we can when they come into the doctor's office. So um, I'll touch on a couple of those things today. Um, let's see if I can make my PowerPoint go here. Oop. All right, so anxiety um, is the first thing this, we're gonna touch on some definitions here. So anxiety is a reaction to an anticipated threat. So it's about something that you're afraid of. And physiologic and behavior manifestations can be shown. So um, I'll give you an example of this is, I used to have no problem flying in an airplane. I love going places and I still do love going places, but I really don't enjoy flying anymore. I had a really scary flight with a lot of turbulence and it was really jarring for me. Um, and so with that experience, I, I had a panic attack on a flight shortly after that, just started crying out of nowhere, just this kind of out of body, like, whoa, what is happening? So from now on, when I fly, I take medication to make me feel more comfortable with flying um, because of this anxiety. So even um, in the days prior, in the weeks prior to flying, um, I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night and I'm sweating or I have a fast heart rate and it's just thinking about that flight. So anxiety is an anticipation about that threat. And then we have fear. And fear is when there's real and present danger. So it's of something. And again, you can see physical and behavioral changes that can be displayed with this. And they, this sort of fear can also change depending on how close that something is to you. So for example, 
if you're afraid of spiders and the spider is outside of your ho house, you're probably okay. But if that spider is on your bathroom sink and you have your toothbrush you go to grab for and it's right in front of you, that's very different than the spider being outside when you're afraid of it. And that may change the way that you respond. So we also think about how close that something is to our patient and why they might respond that way. Um, this response may also be adaptive or survival driven. So today we'll talk about thunderstorms. And you have to think about like a coyote out in, in the, you know, the wild um, or a wolf. Um, when they are outside, if they quite simply don't get away from that thunderstorm and they get struck by lightning, that's not a survival mechanism. So um, this response can be adaptive. And so it can be something that animals genetically have ingrained for some of these things as well. A phobia is a little bit different extreme of an anxiety or a fear. A phobia is an ex excessive and maladaptive fear. So this is a panic, like when I had the panic attack on the plane. It can be a hysteria. Catatonia just means that you just cannot move. You're frozen in place because of how afraid you are. And sometimes we can see these responses to patients that have um, fears due to noises, storms. Um, so we'll kind of touch on that as well. So this is a, um, a nice little uh, video. This is a dog, and so it's, a, it's one of my nurse's dogs and shot from her house, and she has border collies that are about the most well-trained dogs I've ever met in my entire life. And so I want you to watch as he kind of engages with her in this video. So she is trying to offer him treats, um, and he starts to follow her hand as she's um, doing this as well. So you can see the level of intensity on his face, um, but he's got a nice relaxed face and relaxed ears and he's following her commands and her direction. She asks and then the cats come in to help. She touches to his face and then she gives him a treat after she touches. So she's rewarding his calm behavior and doing some kind of subtle training um, in this video. So it's just a nice relaxed looking. Now, Border Collies are definitely more intense dogs than a lot of breeds of dogs are. So he has kind of an intense look on his face during the training. But a relaxed dog generally has a pretty soft face. They can have pretty neutral looking ears. So you see his ears are kind of neutral at the top of his head his relaxed mouth. He also has a nice kind of almond shaped eyes. His, the room was a little dark, so his pupils are a little bit big, but pretty appropriate for the room lighting. And he's got a nice relaxed body posture. So this is a pretty I'm chill, I'm <coughs> kind of dog. We also see um, these dogs that have moderate fear, anxiety, and stress. And this could be either in the veterinary hospital or this could be due to one of these fears and phobias that we're gonna touch on. So a lot of these guys, their face um, will show that their ears will be back or to the side. They sometimes have a furrowed brow, so almost like a little wrinkle in the front of their face. They may actually turn away or refuse to look at you when they're experiencing this sort of stress as well. Oftentimes their mouth is very tight. They may be panting. Um, I'll show you a video here shortly. And it, this dog is gonna be lick, lip licking and yawning. And before I understood that those were signs of fear, I used to think, oh, this dog is in the hospital. Maybe it's tired, maybe it's really relaxed and it's yawning. But a lot of times yawning in a, in a setting of stress can also be a sign that that patient is anxious as well as lip licking. Um, some of these guys may still take treats when they have moderate fear, but they may take them kind of rough or intermittently. Their pupils are often a little bit bigger and their tail is oftentimes down or kind of a little bit even tucked. And they may be attention seeking. They may be running back and forth. Sometimes we see when the thunder is booming outside, the dog will run to the window and run to their owner and just run around the house attention seeking, but just not quite know what to do with themselves. So I wanna watch this video here and then we'll talk about some of the things this dog is doing. So um, don't even worry about what it says to the right there. I just want you to watch the body language on what some of the things here. It'll turn in a second too. So I'm trying to get the attention of this dog. It's a little jumpy, sorry, I'm not sure why it's doing that. So this dog refused to look at me um, during the visit, so it will not make eye contact with me. It goes to lay down, sorry, it's not normally jumpy. Um, and it's yawning and then it licks its lips a few times, but no matter how hard I try to engage with this dog, it will not look at me. It's sniffing the floor, which can be another sign of anxiety. So kind of touching on those things, again, the dog would not make eye contact. 
Pupils were moderately big. Face was really tense on this dog. You can kind of almost see as the video stops there, that furrowed brow, like a little wrinkle, like if you were really stressed and kind of squinting your eyes. The dog was yawning and lip licking and sniffing. Um, the posture, this dog wanted to locate up against the wall in the clinic and had a very tightly positioned body language. So this is a really pretty afraid dog. And this is something that you might even see in your home during a thunderstorm, for example, or during hearing a sound that they're afraid of. Here's another example. As we watch this dog, um, this again was shot in the clinic. So this is a dog that is a little afraid of being in the, in the doctor's office um, and needed some extra therapy and support for that. But this could look like any dog that's fearful outside of the hospital of something as well. So this dog is panting excessively, but the room was not hot. The posture on this dog is gonna be very hunched up. The tail on this dog is going to be kind of down or held low. It's got a little bob tail, but the tail is gonna be held kind of close to the body and this dog is wagging its tail but it's not a relaxed happy wag it's a very anxious quick little fast paced wag so it's important to recognize that a wagging tail in a dog doesn't always equal a relaxed happy less stressed dog it can be a really tense or nervous dog too so it's really has to be read with some of the other body language signs this dog was also looking for an escape route out of the hospital or out of the building the dog was walking around the room sniffing, and that also can be a sign of anxiety with a really tense face. Can't really see the pupils very well, but they're pretty dilated. We'll see if this video plays less jumpy here. So there's that little, little kind of anxious tail wag. Tail's kind of held really tight though to the body. The dog's sniffing around the room and looking for a place to get away. Panting, yawning, really tense looking face. Now, a lot of people think that a dog that looks like this is, you know, perfectly fine to just keep doing what we're doing. But this is the type of dog now that we really go to great measures to try to lessen their fear when they come into our hospital. And so at the end of our discussion today, I'll show you another um, picture of this dog with one of the strategies we tried. So this is the extreme, and these are the ones that most of us can recognize. This is severe fear and anxiety, so it can be manifest with flight. So the dog trying to get away, their ears are gonna be pinned back, their face is really tense, their eyes are dilated, and their tail is tucked. And this is a really common thing that you'll see with a dog that's afraid of something like a storm or fireworks would be another common thing that makes you know booms and bangs. These guys generally won't take treats. They eating is the last thing on their mind. They're in fight or flight survival mode. They're trying to get away. A lot of these dogs are also breathing really fast or panting. We also have dogs that will freeze in the face, and this is cats too, freeze in the face of a fearful stimulus. That just means that they are gonna be sitting there frozen with this hunched posture, and they're oftentimes just trembling uncontrollably. Again, something that a lot of us will see if we have a pet at home that's scared of fireworks or, or storms. They're oftentimes panting, but through a closed mouth even, so they're too scared to even open their mouth. They're just frozen with fear. And then we do sometimes see this too with dogs that are afraid. Most of the pets that we see in our clinic that are, that are aggressive are actually doing so out of defense. So they're just trying to get away. So they're defending themselves. They're trying to retreat. Their ears are back. Their tail is tucked with a crouched posture. And they may be showing all of their teeth, including their cheek teeth, with dilated pupils. Offensive are dogs that we have to be really afraid to want to approach. We wouldn't want to come right up to one of these dogs. So they're lunging at us, their ears are forward, their tail is up and alert, they're showing just their front teeth. And their pupils can actually be any size during offensive aggression. So I thought it was important to cover a few of these appearance sort of things as we discuss the what patients do during storms and fireworks. And because I think it's important for us to recognize these signs in our home so that we know if we have a patient that's scared or fearful and what we might be able to do for them. This I had to include this cute little cat picture. This is a um, a hairless cat. So this is a sphinx that is a calico. And that's just the most beautiful cat, I think, with this calico pattern, but no hair. And she was just as soft as velvet. So kitties also can have um, signs of fear. So they also can avoid or um, hide. Voiding urine or stool, sometimes having urine or stool accidents, vomiting or having diarrhea, 
destroying property is also very common during an episode of fear. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes pet parents come home and they get really upset with their animal for destroying property. And we have to remind them that this is a panic attack for this animal. It is oftentimes not in control of what it is doing. It is responding. And, and oftentimes property damage does happen during the times of extreme fear. They also can self-traumatize so they can lick or groom themselves excessively during fear. Um, some animals will just begin licking a limb and lick it all the way down to where they've um, eroded the skin and caused a big ulcer. So noise phobias um, in, in dogs, um, it's estimated that about 40 to 50% of dogs actually have noise phobias. So that's a really large percentage of dogs that are experiencing a fear to one or many of these things. I found this study kind of interesting. So it showed that if you take your young puppy, um, so this would be puppies starting at two and three weeks of age um, and, and continuing that up until they are six months of age, they found that exposure to things like fireworks, vehicle noise, banging sounds, vacuum cleaners, and I would add blenders and microwaves, loud voices, may actually help them to deal or to reduce with noise phobias as they become adult dogs. So it's just exposing them to those things and having it be starting at a low level we expose them if possible and then rewarding them with verbal praise and treats that that thing is not scary it's not it's okay um, that that may actually be protective to help them as they become adult animals so the first thing we have to do when we're recognizing a noise phobia, it's pretty simple, is that we're recognizing those signs of fear that I've just shown you related to a noise of some sort. Recognizing storm phobia um, is recognizing a profound fear associated with any component of a storm. Storms are tricky though because dogs may be afraid of those little changes in the air that happen when a storm is coming. They can feel those, um, the wind outside, the rust of the leaves, lightning, they can feel the altered pressure, the barometric pressure change, it gets dark outside. Those, any or one or multiple of those things may actually create fear for the animal. So when we're trying to treat a dog with a storm phobia or a noise phobia, we're trying to think about what all may be that creating that fear and what can we do about it for them. So managing noise and storm phobias, the first thing that we like to do is think about the environment that the pet is in. So we, oftentimes the pet will innately locate themselves to an area in the home where the stimulus is minimized. And that makes sense, right? So go protect themselves. So a lot of times the dog will automatically pick the interior room of the house um, devoid of any windows so that they are feeling safer. And it also may be the quieter area of the home where maybe they can't hear the thunderstorm as much. So they're smart, right? They're going to do that. And so we have to be mindful that the pet may have already picked a spot in the home that they like to go during the storm. An interior room, as I mentioned, is oftentimes best. Um, I've even seen people go so far as to put things like hurricane shutters on their windows so that they can pull those closed if their dog is that afraid because it insulates against some of the sounds and some of the sights that they would see outside. We also have a lot of clients that will do white noise, turn on a ceiling fan, or use classical music. There was a nice study that showed that in a shelter setting, in an animal shelter, um, the animals in the shelter showed signs of less stress when classical music was played for them. So we oftentimes use classical music both in the hospital setting and at home as well during times of fear for an afraid animal. Room darkening may also be helpful. We know that a lot of cats and dogs will locate themselves to a closet or an interior bathroom. So anything we can do to help to reduce that fear for them is great with regard to the environment. A lot of pets with noise and storm phobias do require medication or other supportive measures. Um, so that's something that's always talking with my client about whether the pet may be may be able to show less fear just with modifying the environment. In some cases, we may actually need medicine because it's really hard for them to learn a new response to something if they're so anxious inside. And I can attest to that knowing that for me, the plane trip, I've got to have my anti-anxiety medication or I feel just quite simply too scared.
These are a few training strategies that we'll use. Um, I would say, well, actually, not the first one. So let me touch on that first. So the first one is a training strategy that can be used, not one that I would ever recommend. Flooding is a strategy where you just continually expose the animal to the stimulus that makes them afraid until said response goes away. The problem with that is that we can have animals that quite simply have just this mental capacity that they are so overstimulated by whatever is making them afraid, this is not at all healthy for them to expose them to a high level of the stimulus um, because a lot of them it makes the fear worse. So it is not advised. So what I should say is we use these three lower ones. So classical conditioning is taking a situation where the animal is not currently afraid of something and we pair a very potent stimulus with a very neutral stimulus. So for example, you bring your new puppy home and you pair food with a can opener, right? So that's something that they understand that sound of that can opener equals I'm gonna eat something really good. Or you pair the vacuum cleaner with something really good. So we pair those two together so that the animal never sees that frightening or what could be a frightening object as frightening at all. Desensitization is taking something that the animal is already afraid of, so it would be a low level of that stimulus. We expose them to that without seeing signs of fear. So an example of that, we will sometimes have owners use a CD or a YouTube video of storm sounds, and they will play that at a really low level to their animal, maybe they play it in the winter months when storms are less common, and we know that there aren't going to be, we cannot mimic all of the things, so I can't make the ozone changes to the air, the barometric pressure changes, I can't mimic those, but I can mimic, mimic the sound of a sun, thunderstorm, and I can play it at a low level, and I can reward that animal with, um, with their calm behavior. So counter conditioning, again, is taking an unpleasant with a pleasant experience. So now I'm, I've expanded on that desensitization and I'm pairing that storm sound with food, treats, or massage. And so that animal is relaxed, hopefully, while they're hearing those sounds. And then we continually turn up the sound and hope as long as the animal's not showing fear, I'm going to turn up the sound and I'm going to pair it with something very favorable. So again, some of the ways that we do this, a lot of times with noise um, phobias or storm phobias, I do encourage the client to condition the animal to a head halter leash or a harness and leash. And so hopefully that animal is, is well conditioned to following commands while they're on that leash and harness. Um, so training basic commands so that the pet can achieve kind of focus when they, um, so not during the scary event, but this is all training prior to the, to the event. We want to also consider using a calm location and then mat training. I'll touch on mat training here shortly in a little bit more detail. And then using that desensitizing and counter conditioning, we would use a recording of a thunderstorm. Another example would be a dog that maybe it's a hunting dog and you're trying to expose them to the sound of a gunshot and hopefully don't want that animal to show fear of that. So you start with something a little quieter, like a starter pistol wrapped in a towel at a great distance from the animal, and you expose them to the sound, and you're pairing that with a treat, toy, or massage, so that, again, that stimulus is never considered frightening, rather than shooting the gun for the first time right next to the dog. And then again, we increase the volume or intensity of the stimulus, pairing it with the treat or toy. So some of the challenges that we have in these patients is that some of these dogs, it's a genetic thing for them. They maybe had um, genetic or lineage, maybe they're a specific breed that tends to be a little more high stress than another one. It may also be learned. Sometimes we'll see one pet living with another really fearful pet actually um, take on some of those same fearful traits because they've learned them from another housemate. We can also see a traumatic event. So an example of that would be the dog that survives having their home destroyed by a tornado. That's going to be a very traumatic event that occurs in that pet's life that may be a big challenge in trying to manage its fear during storm season here in Kansas. 
The stimulus may also be unpredictable. So I can predict some types of things, like I can say, well, it's July 4th, and so there's going to be fireworks, or in, in our area anyway, it starts about June 25th and goes until about July 15th. So I don't know about your area, but for us, it's the fireworks start really early, but I know that they're going to peak on the 4th of July. So I can predict that stimulus, and I can know that how to be prepared prepared for my pet. So maybe we keep it in an interior room or maybe we use medicine that day for the 4th of July. But we also know that some stimuli might be unpredictable, like that pop-up rain shower or thunderstorm that happens and you're at work or you're at school and your pet is at home. So in some of these patients, they will need to be on medication during storm season or even year round for those types of fears or anxiety. One of the other things that I teach my clients is that we want to acknowledge calm behavior for the pet. So meaning that I will reward them with treats and verbal praise and massage if the pet can cover up under the blankets and can lay there comfortably, relax during the thunder. And I will actually have the owner pair a very special treat with each boom of thunder. So as the thunder booms, the dog receives a treat as long as they're not showing signs of fear. So again, we're acknowledging and rewarding calm behavior. For some of them, it's going to take medication to get them relaxed enough to accomplish that. Owners may contribute to the problem because if they're not rewarding calm behavior, that makes it tough. All right, let's talk about separation anxiety a little bit. So separation anxiety um, can occur in both dogs and cats. It's definitely more recognized in dogs, and it is estimated that 14% of dogs seen in U.S. veterinary clinics actually have separation anxiety. So that's a pretty staggering number. And the question is why? Well, we do think that there is also some inherited or breeding that may contribute to that. So some specific uh, dogs may be more geared or socially oriented towards humans. Um, it may also be triggered by something. So a few examples of that, um, boarding in a hospital, some dogs will have separation anxiety after an episode of boarding or a transient or short period of separation anxiety. Hospitalization, especially at an early age, um, while the puppy is developing, may actually trigger separation anxiety. Being abandoned, um, so those dogs that are left by the roadside and end up in a shelter or a rescue may have a higher potential to have separation anxiety. We see a lot here at Kansas State when we have students that go from a scheduled day-to-day -day classroom schedule in their first, second, and third years to coming to the hospital and being on clinical rotations, a lot of students are pulling um, night hours or coming in at odd times of the day or night, and that can be really hard on their pets at home. And so sometimes a job or schedule change can also trigger separation anxiety. We can also see it due to death or loss of a pack member, and that can be a human pack member. It can also be a loss of another pet in the home that can also trigger separation anxiety to initiate. Barrier frustration is kind of a unique form of separation anxiety. So I put the briefcase on there because honestly, for these pets that have barrier frustration, it does not matter whether you're home or you've picked up your briefcase and left for the day. These pets, if they cannot see you, they are, it's like you're not even home. So if, if they are in a crate or an exercise pen and you go into the next room, they panic. Or the dog who follows their owner everywhere, or the cat that follows their owner everywhere through the home and will not separate themselves from the owner. Um, so even a wall or a door can be a barrier that can make them very anxious. So how do we diagnose separation anxiety? So it is an extreme attachment to one or more family members. In my experience, it's oftentimes one person, but it isn't always. Sometimes it's one or more family members. These are animals that oftentimes, as I mentioned, they follow their owners. They may vocalize associated with being out of the room or when the owners leave. They oftentimes will sit and stare at their people. They can jump onto them. They may also be the animal, especially cats that sit and climb on top of you, won't let you work on your project. They just will not separate themselves from you. Can all be forms of separation anxiety. 
The signs of separation anxiety are often the worst within the first 10 minutes of the animal being separated from their human. And I would say that frequently um, we diagnose this based off of video or audio surveillance. I'm a big fan of these types of nanny cam types of things. We have a lot of people that will record their animal when they've walked out of the um, home and see kind of what the pet does. A lot of times we also have people come in because they've gotten a complaint to their land Lord, because the dog is howling while they're gone or destroying property. So it may be that they're observing the anxiety and it may just be that we have to record and see what happens when they're away. And again, that being separated could be a virtual absence where the person is just in the other part of the home or a true absence from the home. So before the pet owner leaves, um, I took that same picture of the border collie because you can see the intensity on that dog's face as he looks at her. In this case, this is an out of context picture because he was just in the middle of training. But you might see that same picture or that same appearance in a dog that has anxiety. So prior to the departure, the dog may be more cat, may be more depressed. In some cases, they're really hyper attached to their person. They may not want to eat. And I've even had dogs and cats become aggressive towards their owners as they try to leave the home. Some of the dogs will jump up and bite on the pant legs of the person. I've had them biting the shoelaces as they're trying to put their shoes on or get their bags to leave the home. While the owner is gone, this sad little dog staring out the window is sometimes what we see, but other times it can escalate much beyond that. And again, the signs of anxiety are oftentimes worse within the first few minutes of the person leaving, but they can continue throughout the entire time the person is gone, or they may wax and wane where the dog continues to howl or bark um, do, during the time, or they may have periods that they stop, lay down and rest for a while, and then start barking, howling, or vocalizing again. These animals oftentimes destroy things, and I've had a number of times where the dog destroys at the door where the owner has left. So they're damaging around the door frame. I've had them chew up and eat the woodwork. I've had them eat drywall, knock down pictures, chew up potted plants. Some of these dogs and a cats too will excessively groom or chew on themselves. And some on video are quite sad. They circle, they pace, they wander just looking for their person. So rather distressing to see that. When they're gone, it's almost like this, this rooster sort of announcing that the person is back home. So oftentimes when the pet owner arrives back to the home, they get an exuberant or an excessive greeting from this pet. And sometimes they'll even void urine. So they'll have that kind of excitable urination and some owners come in with that history that every time they come home, the dog has piddled right there on the carpet or on the floor as soon as they arrive home. So these are all anxious animals. Separation anxiety in cats. Um, this is a, a picture of a cat that was all very anxious in the hospital, so much so that you see these little squinted eyes. This cat would not make eye contact with me, wanted to just look down and just just be invisible, basically. Um, separation anxiety in cats can cause a lot of things. So this was a large study. They had 136 cats that they studied over a nine-year period. And what they showed is this most stark uh, one is 75% of cats with separation anxiety urinated on their owner's bed. So um, a lot of times people think the cat urinated on the bed because they hate me and they just, they don't like us and they peed on the bed. Well, the reality is a lot of cats that urinate on bedding or urinate inappropriately are really stressed out cats and separation anxiety can make cats go in other places other than their litter box. Sometimes they have inappropriate bowel movements. Cats can vocalize when they have separation anxiety. They also can walk around the house just howling or vocalizing, trying to find their person. Some of them will excessively groom or pull the hair out on their body, especially on their tummies. I see that a lot. And some of them will just hide or not want to eat or just sit and tremble while their person is gone. So cats too can suffer from separation anxiety, just like dogs. But I oftentimes think it's harder to recognize and it's harder. The owners may not always recognize that the cat has anxiety. So at the veterinary clinic, what do we do? So first off, we have to get a really, really good history for these animals to find out if there could be a medical problem that's contributing 
contributing to one of these disorders or is it a behavioral problem or is it a little bit of both? Um, that, so we're doing a lot of evaluation to see if we can help to understand what could be contributing to that. We do a really good physical exam on the patient and then we oftentimes do some laboratory testing. And there's a couple of reasons for the laboratory testing. One of those is that if we find or we think there may be a medical problem, perhaps I find that the cat's urinating on the bed because it has an infection or a bladder stone that I might be able to fix. Other times we do laboratory testing because the pet may require medication to help to address its anxiety. And I need to have that information to make sure that I can safely prescribe one of those medications. We also talk about a treatment strategy or what can be done to help to manage that, that condition. One of the things that we always talk about is blocking and cleaning the soiled or damaged areas. So we use, if it's urine or stool, we have to use specific treatments to remove the soiling. If the pet has been damaging um, parts of the home, we obviously have to block access to those areas. We also have to talk to the family about consistency. So we wanna reward following instructions and calm behavior. Um, so oftentimes teaching things like sit and stay with those with those head collars or harnesses can be helpful. We also use a system some, sometimes called nothing is free. And what that means is the pet needs to do something for you in order to be rewarded for that type of behavior. So we may ask the pet to sit and then we're gonna give them verbal praise and a treat for example, or we may ask them to stay. One of the things that I also encourage is predictable physical and mental activities. Animals need to have a schedule also. They need to understand when they go for walks, when they do certain enrichment, and that's different for every pet's needs as far as how much of that is needed. I also talk about independence training, and I mentioned I talk about mat training. So one of my favorite tools is something called the Treat and Train. This was developed by a um, veterinary behaviorist named Dr. Sophia Yin, who has since passed away. Um, but Dr. Sophia Yin developed this Treat and Train, and there's a, there's a lot of YouTube videos. You can go and, and look up the Treat and Train. But what it is, is it's a remote-controlled treat dispensing device, and you actually can set it on a mat. And then you can teach the dog to go to mat or go to place. And so it's used to reward the animal remotely. So it doesn't have to be the person just saying good job, but it actually can encourage the pet to be physically separated from the person so that they can reward them for sitting on the mat and feeling comfortable. And the mat can be anything as simple as a bath mat or their favorite pet bed. Um, but I've used this treat and train for a number of these guys to train independence. And I'm sure there's other devices out there too. This is just one that I've, I've really enjoyed working with. With separation anxiety, in an ideal world, none of us would ever leave the home. We'd be with the pet, right? But we know that that's not feasible for most of us. So avoiding departures, if possible, would mean that we might use a house sitter or we might use a daycare for the pet during the time that we're working on addressing the anxiety and the training. A lot of dogs are quite a bit worse in confinement, meaning a lot of dogs are worse in their dog kennel as far as their level of anxiety, but unfortunately a lot of dogs get into a lot of trouble when they aren't in their kennel. Um, so we really have to address that with each individual case because some animals, dogs especially, I've had them break teeth, I've had them break off toenails, trying to dig and chew their way out of a kennel. And it is impressive how well they can get out of what you couldn't even imagine they could get out of. So we do talk with the clients about trying to revisit really positive crate training, making sure the pet has a good association with the crate. Some of them do. Some of these dogs love their crate. They just don't love to be in the crate when their person is gone. And so that must be addressed in the big picture. We also use desensitizing and counter conditioning, as I mentioned earlier. So we have the family practice those departure cues without leaving. And what that means is every one of us, when we leave each day, has little subtle things that we do consistently that our pet begins to pick up on. And common examples of that are rattling our car keys, putting our shoes or jacket on, picking up our purse or our backpack. And so we actually have owners practice doing those things, but they do them in a way that hopefully doesn't create fear and they do them even when they're not walking out the door. So they begin to desensitize the pet to those little cues because they're actually leaving. We also talk about graduated departures. 
And what that means is we start with short departures and we lengthen them when there's no anxiety. We also pair our departures with positive things like using food games, puzzle toys, or a special treat. So they get that special treat prior to us leaving. The problem is you have to be a little careful with that because some dogs are so smart that they figure out that that special treat or toy only comes when you leave. And so I also tell people to periodically offer the special treat even when you're home, just so it doesn't again become predictable and cause them to become more fearful. We do want to avoid verbal and physical punishment. Those are not helpful ever, but especially in a patient that's anxious. It makes them more anxious. We also should avoid emotional departure and greetings. So there is some people that think this isn't true. I will say that I generally still try to follow this where I will tell the owner for that last little bit before you leave, I oftentimes have them stop engaging with the pet rather than do the little, oh, I'm so sorry, I've got to leave. And they greet the, you know, they greet them excessively. We speak in those high pitched voices. And a lot of pets become more anxious when they hear the anxiety in our voices. Is. Remembering that some of these pets also need medication in addition to the behavior modification. Some pets are quite simply so anxious that they are not capable of learning a new way to respond to the anxiety inducing events. So they do need medication. They need to work with their doctor. Medication, as I mentioned, is there are no medications um, that are approved for, for um, long term of noise and <clears throat> storm phobias. There is one medication that is approved for short-term use for dogs with noise phobias. Um, there are also, um, there is one drug that's available and approved for separation anxiety in dogs. We use a lot of drugs that are not even approved for that use, so that's common in veterinary medicine, so that's you have to work with your doctor to see what they're comfortable with. And the goal is to reduce the pet's overall anxiety so that they can learn a new response to a previously fearful stimulus. We use a lot of alternative strategies. I mentioned auditory distraction like white noise, classical music. Um, this is kind of a fun one. Most of these have no research or science behind them. Um, some of them have a few things, but this is a product called Mutt Muffs. Um, and again, I, there's lots of these out there. These are just a few that I've had over the years. This was designed by um, a person who was flying in a private aircraft with his dog, and his dog was a little afraid of the sound of the aircraft. It was very loud. And so he used he designed the Mutt Muffs so that to cover the dog's ears during the, the plane travel so it would be less frightening. I've had people try these kinds of products during a storm to see if that helps to dial down some of the auditory stimulation. Um, this is kind of a fun one. Uh, nothing cuter than a dog wearing a cape, in my opinion, but there, there's several of these out there. Um, what I think I had seen is that um, there was none of these capes that did better than another, but they actually did see that these dogs seemed a little less anxious. So it's a storm defender cape, but there, there's lots of these out on the market, but you can have the dog wear this little cape that Maybe it helps, maybe it doesn't. But these are some of the things that you can find if you go online. Um, uh, we have seen good luck with um, the doggles are used for a lot of medical conditions in dogs because of um, helping to block sunlight in dogs that have eye problems. But you can use things like that to minimize some of the bright lights and flashes from lightning. Um, I have been pretty fond of the Thunder Cap. This is um, a product that actually covers the eyes. I'll show you a picture in a second of this being used on one of those anxious dogs. And it's, it doesn't completely block their vision, but it lessens it. So it's a kind of a lessened stimulus, if you will. Um, we do use a lot of these in the practice. Um, these are the thunder jackets or anxiety wraps. These are like swaddling babies, um, so hopefully comforting to help to um, sort of snug them up um, to reduce their anxiety. This is a picture. <clears throat> of that dog who was running around the practice earlier. Um, and I'll show you the picture here. This dog with gentle restraint was sitting with that calming cap over his eyes and an anxiety wrap. Um, and he's still panting, but he was nicely sitting on the mat in the room. He was no longer panicking and running around the room. And then this is a side profile of that anxiety or thunder jacket. Um, so there's lots of these different kind of products on the market. And I wouldn't advocate any one over another other than to say there's lots of options out 
out there. And I have no problem if a client wants to try some of these things, it's perfectly fine. The thing I will remind them of is if it's a dog um, that, or a cat, I would never leave them alone with one of these things on because sometimes pets will chew up or eat things. And so they've always got to be supervised when they're wearing clothing or any of these kinds of items. Um, another point is that we need to educate and empathize with our clients and our patients. Um, again, some pet owners believe that the pet is acting out of anger or spite, and that couldn't be further from the truth, is that these animals are very afraid, um, and in some cases not in control of their actions. The pet is experiencing an emotional disorder, and so it's really important to always remember that um, when we are addressing their concerns. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things I always teach my students is these appointments really cannot be rushed and we do spend a lot of time communicating with our clients via phone or in the after the appointment time to try to work with them to make sure that we're all on the same page and helping to lessen the anxiety for that pet. There's a nice relaxed dog for you to, to finish up here. So I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Okay, the floor is open for your questions. Does anyone have a question for Dr. Boyer? I do. You do? do. Okay, please say your name. My name is Patricia Hornbeck. I have a nine-year-old corgi, Cardigan corgi. Our house makes cracking noises at night, so he constantly spends the entire night pacing and panting and constantly to relax anywhere. For a while, he found a quiet space and he was comfortable in a closet, climbing into a closet. He no longer does that. He just paces and pants around the house all night. This mainly happens in the winter when the house is cooling down at night. And we've lived in other houses. He's not had this problem. And you've lived there how long? Four years, four and a half years. And you said the dog was how old again? Nine. Okay. Nine years old. Okay. So I think, the, and have you sought care for him just yet for this? I have. We had him medically tested and found that his, hormone, his hormones and his thyroid were out of balance. So yes. we've been treating him. Yeah. Um, he's now in balance, but he still has this issue. Yeah. Um, and I consulted with our vet. He's on some medication, but unfortunately, I can't remember the name of it. Yeah. Um, but nothing seems to help. That's a frustrating one. And, and there, there are, sometimes there is an underlying medical condition or maybe contributing to it. And we do see a lot of dogs as they get older that also can have other problems that are, are occurring too. Um, sometimes there are things going on cognitively as pets get older or they've experienced some stressor that it's really hard to um, override that. So, I, I mean, th that's, a, that's a tough one. I mean, with those kind of patients, I think as much history as you can give to the veterinarian um, kind of on the day-to-day. -day. Um, I think too, for me, when I'm seeing a patient like that, oftentimes having a video that includes audio um, as well can be really helpful to sort of see what all the pet is doing and how they're responding to their environment. Um, and then generally it's doing that good physical exam. We do a good eye, ear, orthopedic, neurological exam of those patients to look for any underlying medical contributors, making sure they don't have any arthritis, pain anywhere. Um, and then we start talking about kind of how can we modify that behavior? So that one, I, I can't say that I would be able to give you any easy answers either. I think that's going to have to be um, a more comprehensive assessment. Right. And it is related to the house because when we take him away on vacation for a month, he displays none of this behavior. Interesting. So and if we let him out into the backyard, this fence, he will not come back in the house. Wow. So we have to actually take him out on a leash because otherwise he doesn't want to come back in. You said the house makes a lot of noise. Is that what you said at the beginning? It makes, it makes like a cracking noise more in the winter than the summer. Wow. That is an interesting one. So you definitely <laughs> normal activity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's very intriguing well, to me. I bet acts just like you do. He's well, absolutely stumped. He doesn't. He doesn't know what to do. So, 
Well, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, if we know that there's things, and the question is, is it the sounds in the house that scare the dog or panic the dog, or is there something else that's occurring? So have you ever tied it directly to the sound that he hears to then showing yes. the fear? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He will display it during the day a little if there's a, that sound comes on during the day, but because we're up and about and moving, yeah. it, it bothers him less, but he does react to it. And have you ever tried like the classical music or white noise or anything like that to mask the sound? We've tried the white noise. We haven't tried the classical music. Very, very interesting. If your veterinarian fixes it, let me know. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, it is an interesting thing yeah, because not that it was a medical issue. We, well, we generally with those kinds of things, if you've associated it with the sound, I guess the first question I would have is, can we pinpoint where the sound is originating from and see if a contractor can come in and remove the sound? Or is it just the, I have a, you know, the creaky house, you know, kind of thing. Um, but if there's anything we can do to modify that, and then my other thought would be trying to desensitize and counter conditions. So basically each time the sound is made, we would reward calm behavior. Um, so, yeah, it sounds like your doctor has a good handle on her as best a handle as they can. Um, that's a really intriguing one, I will say. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> we have another question, Dr. Boyer. Please say yep. your name. Um, my name is Casey Blades. I am a freshman at LA North High School. And uh, my question is, um, can your pet be scared of their own housemates? I'll give you an example. It is possible. Yeah, you could, yeah, tell me what you're thinking. Okay. So, um, um, uh, so when my father and I first brought our cats to um, his girlfriend's house in Parkville, um, um, I'm honestly pretty sure that one of my cats uh, was a little bit nervous about being in uh, about being in the new environment mm -hmm. and uh, and and my dad's girlfriend's basset hound tanner was was curious and uh the cat decided to hiss at him and box his ears a little bit mm -hmm. so he <laughs> has had a constant fear of getting hissed at boxed at so yep yeah, so it, to answer your question, it's not at all uncommon to see anxieties between housemates, whether it be one cat to multiple other cats in the home. Um, it, it's really common in cats, and we see it definitely in dogs or between dogs and cats, where it's the dog afraid of the cat or the cat of the dog. And that's, I mean, you're smart, right? I mean, that's an early experience where the dog experienced a fearful traumatic event. We have dogs that can get cat scratch through their eyeball and end up losing an eye because, um, you know, cats have weapons and they are not afraid to use them sometimes if the dog gets too close to them and they're afraid of them. So um, it can go both ways. And so, yeah, it's not at all uncommon to see fear between species or between one species to the other. Um, and so it's something that definitely requires a lot of work. There are some animals that can cohabitate very happily. It just means giving each of them enough space. Um, there's, a, there's a few really nice websites. One of them is um, the Ohio State University. Their College of Veterinary Medicine has a website called the Indoor Pet Initiative. Um, and they provide some really nice resources for both veterinarians, veterinary students, and clients as well, where it talks about things that we can do to enrich the environment of indoor pets um, and to make it less stressful on them. Um, but we definitely know um, in multi-cat households, especially the more cats that are cohabitating, oftentimes we see more problems like inappropriate elimination or anxiety types of disorders. So it's definitely something that may be able to be improved upon between the fear of the dog to the cat. So you definitely, if you haven't talked to your doctor about it, you need to because they may have something specific for you guys to work on um, because I, there's definitely it's a common problem and there definitely are things that can be done we have another one dr boyer yep great the black sweatshirt please say your name and state your question i'm katie jensen 
um, listen to the last question. Oh, okay. for minutes, and then you guys can leave right at 4.30, even if she's still talking. Okay. Um, yes, um, we're still gonna go ahead. We've got some questions. Blue Valley Caps, I think has a question. We do, we do. Um, so I have a seven and a half year old male. Well, I have two Basset Hounds. They are bonded pair. The male we call a wackadoodle. Um, there are certain people that he is immediately fearful of and we can't understand why he chooses some people. There's not a gesture. There's not just somebody will walk into our house and he, he'll either run and cower yeah. or he'll walk right up and sniff and happy. If it is yeah. really bizarre, it's offensive to some people, you know, yeah. like dogs always love me. Yeah. But, and he's always been like that since her, how long have you had the dog? Um, since puppy, since yeah. brand new. Yeah. yeah. And that's just been kind of who he is. Yeah. And does he show that fear outside of your home as well? I think so. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, first thing I will say is I always recommend discussing that with your primary care doctor because um, they know the pet best and can give you guidance specific for your animal doing a good physical and making sure that there's not a medical problem that would lead to that behavior. So that's first and foremost. Um, we do commonly talk about just kind of generalized socialization. Um, the response that I oftentimes get, some people think, oh, my pet must have been, you know, injured by a certain person. And, and truly, while that's always possible, what we see probably a majority of the time is that it has to do with either maybe one, the genetics or the inherent dog themselves, or a lot of times it's also a combination of their early experiences. So we see a lot of dogs that if they never experience somebody of a different ethnicity or with facial hair or with glasses um, or a man versus a woman or vice versa, children, the elderly, um, somebody who walks with a walking stick, for example, or a walker, all of a sudden they respond to those things out of fear because it's the unknown. So oftentimes it has nothing to do with a previous negative experience, rather it's just a lack of an experience. And with dogs, there's this key socialization time that they experience oftentimes between two and about 12 to 14 weeks old, where they get exposed or don't get exposed to things and can develop certain fears as a result. So what, what a couple of things that I was thinking of, and this is of course barring if your veterinarian has any other specific guidelines, um, that treat and train on the YouTube video, if you, I would encourage you to watch that because it shows an example of dogs that charge the front door when somebody comes to the home and they are just barking and whether it's happy barking or not happy barking, it's kind of frightening for the person. Um, and so what they did was they worked with the treat and train to encourage the dog to go to matter or go to place and receive treats. Um, and so the association was that when somebody comes to the door or somebody comes in, food happens or I get a treat at my go to my place and it's happy and I feel comfortable. Um, Another thing that I've sometimes had people do, and this is of course barring that the dog wouldn't have any you know, risk of biting somebody. Um, sometimes we do even simple things like making sure that there's treats outside of the home being kept available so that um, when somebody knocks on the door, there's treats available and they immediately toss the treat into the house when they arrive. Um, so that just depends. Some dogs aren't very food motivated, so it doesn't always help. But um, I think you know that's one where I would first and foremost talk to your doctor to see if there's a specific concern that they would want to address. Um, and then there are some other tools that you could watch like on the video and see if you can figure out if any of those might be helpful for you. But that is a frustrating problem for sure because um, to see those signs of anxiety on our pet's faces are pretty tough and it's hard too if it's somebody who is a dog person and thinks, well, why don't they like me? What did I do wrong kind of thing? So they can definitely be offended easily. I understand that. Good. Thank you so much. And I didn't even consider something like, um, like glasses, something that we wouldn't necessarily notice, but yeah, they, sometimes there are things that are really subtle, um, that maybe he's just never experienced that before. So, um, there's a lot of things when, when puppies are little that I encourage people to encourage, uh, encourage them to demonstrate to the dog. So let them see somebody who has their arm in a cast or who walks with a walker, who wears glasses or who's a different ethnicity. Um, because those things, if never experienced before, can be frightening later on. Thank you so much. Thanks for all these ideas. I appreciate it. Any That's it for questions, questions from our end. 
Okay, thanks for joining us, Kelly. Um, I'm gonna let people know that if you need to leave, I've passed out verification slips, but if you'd like to stay for additional questions, please feel free to do so. I think we had one from that black sweatshirt. What's your name again? Katie. Katie. Yeah. Okay, so my question is, what procedure do you use for those offensive uh, animals that show fear? So what kinds of things do we do? Yeah, what's your procedure? Because so in the clinic setting? Yeah, in the clinic. So um, in the clinic, um, there's lots of things. Um, there's really, well, we think about kind of when pets come into the doctor's office from the very beginning, when they enter into the waiting room, there can be fear. Some of them are afraid of other dogs or cats. So there are some hospitals that go so far as to have dog only and cat only waiting rooms. I don't have the luxury of that here. Um, we, um, we also sometimes have owners call directly from the car and go right into a room so that they don't have to wait in a waiting area if they're fearful. Um, we try to use things like non slip mats. We use a lot of towels on top of tables. We look at pets a lot of times on the floor because some pets feel uncomfortable up on a table because they're told at home not to get up on furniture. And so when we put them on a table, that can be frightening for some animals. Um, we also try to do a lot of the work if I can while the family's with us because some pets get a little bit of relaxation when they have their family around them. So that doesn't work for every procedure that we have to do, but sometimes I try that. Um, we also use medication sometimes. So if a pet is afraid of coming into the doctor, um, we may use some pre-veterinary anti-anxiety medication so that when they come in, they're less anxious to see us. So there's really a lot of things that go into, um, into that visit. Um, we also use a lot of food and a lot of treats. So um, I always check with the family and make sure that they don't have a problem with us offering a specific therapy. Um, but we use a lot of food because that's a huge motivator for a lot of pets as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, Dr. Boyer, we, yep. uh, Blue Valley Caps has, has said thank you, and I would also like to say thank you from K-State Olathe. Thank yes, you very so good. much for enlightening us. Thanks again. I have two more tools in my tool belt now. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Take care.